Welcome to MA3D1. This video is about the Blasius similarity solution to flow past a flat plate. Let's start with a brief recap. We have a flat plate uh, aligned with a uniform flow at infinity of speed u. Uh, we will take the direction of the flow and the direction of the flat plate to be the x-axis and y is perpendicular to the flat plate and we'll look at two-dimensional flow here and we want to know as a consequence of the no slip boundary condition uh, what is the flow profile that develops in the boundary layer the boundary layer is of thickness delta where delta is approximately we got two expressions for delta so far square root of nu l over u or delta is square root of nu x over u and at this point it is time to decide which one of them is correct how to interpret either of these expressions uh, it is expected that the fluid will satisfy the parental boundary layer equations instead of the Navier-Stokes equations because these are the simplified version of the Navier-Stokes equations in case delta is much less than L where L is the length of the flat plate. So uh, let us see how one goes about using the parental, uh, the boundary layer equation and find a similarity solution for uh, the flow past a flat plate. So this, we expect there to be a similarity solution, well at least we suspect that there is a similarity solution, so it's worth examining uh, whether there really will be a similarity solution. If you zoom in close to the leading edge of the flat plate, then we have the following situation. The flat plate is very, very long. It's so long that we can even take it to be infinite. And uh, the, f the free stream flow, the uniform flow far away, is the uniform flow. So now you can imagine zooming in and out onto this leading edge of the flat plate near the origin so this is the this is the origin that's the x-axis and that's the y-axis zooming in and out uh, into the origin the flat plate which is now approximately infinitely long still appears to be infinitely long uh, the thickness of the plate is negligible and so far as you don't zoom in too much or if you take the plate to be infinitely thin then the, the plate still appears infinitely thin the flow far away is always free stream equal to the uniform flow so we appear to have geometric scale invariance and now it is time to check whether we have dynamic scale invariance so what you do is write oh but before you do that there's one step we almost forgot to do which is we should do uh, the we should look at the flow outside the boundary there we'll call this the outer flow and examine what the outer flow looks like whether we can uh, conclude something from the outer flow in the outer flow the velocity is the uniform flow because the velocity is the uniform flow, pressure is a constant. And now let's take the y momentum equation from the parental boundary layer. So pressure outside the boundary layer everywhere is a constant. In this region, the pressure everywhere is a constant. From dp dy equal to zero in the boundary layer, 
that means the pressure does not change along y within the boundary layer well if the pressure doesn't change along y then you can go to the edge of the boundary layer read the value of the pressure there and that's the same pressure throughout the boundary layer at that level x and from that we can conclude that the pressure everywhere within the boundary layer must also be a constant So this, is, this conclusion is really a combination of two observations. One is that the pressure outside is a constant, constant with both x and y. And within the boundary layer, the pressure is constant in y. It can vary with x, but because of continuity, as soon as you get outside the boundary layer, it has to have the same value everywhere outside the boundary layer. So because pressure cannot change with y then it must have the same value within the boundary layer also so it's a combination of these two things but having now said that the pressure is a constant within the boundary layer that means this term the dpdx term it identically vanishes in the boundary layer and uh, I'm going to now make use of this fact. So now dp dx vanishes, that term is gone. I can take the row on the other side and define, we have, we have defined this before, mu over rho is the kinematic viscosity and we have u du dx plus v du dy is nu d2u dx squared. I've already satisfied the y momentum conservation equation and I have to satisfy the mass conservation du dx plus du dy equals zero. And this is these two equations are to be solved subject to at x goes to minus infinity. Actually we don't need to go all the way to minus infinity at x equals 0, u equals capital U, at y approaching infinity, u is capital U, and at y equals 0, finally we can impose the no slip conditions. The first condition says that up all the way up to this thin knife edge, the flow does not perceive the presence of the knife edge. Now, this is a little bit of a stretch. We don't know this is going to be true, but it turns out that indeed it is true. Because the boundary layer does not provide much resistance to the flow, there's no reason for the flow upstream of the flat plate to change. So we can bring the uniform flow all the way up to the edge of the boundary layer. Now, if you go outside the boundary layer, y goes to infinity in that direction. When you get outside the boundary layer, you, get, you recover the free stream and that's that condition. And finally, on the surface of the plate, right there, everywhere on the surface of the plate, we have the no slip condition. Okay? So let me write this, no slip. This, these two are the uniform flow conditions. So these are the equations we want to solve together and these are the equations we will use to check for dynamic scale invariance. The way you do that is you say x, no, first step, let's start with u. u goes to alpha u twiddle, v goes to beta v twiddle x goes to gamma x twiddle and y goes to delta y twiddle these are the independent variables and these are the independent variables and we have to allow for each one of them to be scaled independently now we have done this many times so i am not i'm going to be a little fast 
and I will just write down the scaled version of the uh, equations and here we have u twiddle del u twiddle del x twiddle plus v twiddle and I'll leave some space for the prefactor del u twiddle del y twiddle and relative to the u du dx which will have a term of alpha squared over gamma uh, so this will have a beta over delta gamma over alpha in front of it equals new now uh, d2 u twiddle dy twiddle square this will give me a alpha over delta squared but i have alpha squared over gamma here so alpha over delta squared gamma over alpha delta squared All right. So this, uh, these are the terms we will get for the first equation and for the second equation we will get del u twiddle del x twiddle plus del v twiddle del y twiddle gamma beta over alpha delta equals zero. The boundary conditions are at x twiddle equals zero u twiddle now u goes to alpha is u over alpha and y twiddle goes to infinity u twiddle is u over alpha and at y twiddle equals zero u twiddle equals zero right. those are the boundary conditions and now you will notice for the two equations two sides to be identical we need gamma over alpha beta over delta equals 1 we need gamma over alpha delta squared equals 1 from there and there and there and we need alpha equals 1 from there and if you solve for these in terms so, so alpha is uh, 1 that mean and uh, this equation will give you beta in terms of delta and gamma so we have beta equals delta over gamma and this equation gives you delta in terms of gamma delta is square root of gamma so if delta is square root of gamma beta becomes 1 over square root of gamma okay and if i choose i'm free to choose gamma arbitrarily and so long as i choose beta and delta and alpha according to this relation i satisfy scale invariance which means if to the original equations u is a function of x and y and v is another function of x and y if this was a solution to the original equations because the scaled equations are identical they would have the same functional form for the solution v twiddle equals g twiddle y twiddle but now i can substitute u twiddle and v twiddle in terms of u and me, v and u twiddle is u over alpha so from this we have u over alpha equals f of x twiddle is x over gamma y over delta and v over beta equals g of x over gamma y over delta and alpha is 1 so and beta is 1 over square root of gamma so we have u is a function of x 
over gamma y over square root of gamma and v is beta beta is 1 over root gamma function of x over gamma y over root gamma this expression holds for any value of gamma for any gamma greater than 0 so we can we can pick x for any x greater than 0 and we have u is a function of 1 comma y over square root of x and v is 1 over square root of x so we pick gamma equals x function of 1 comma y over square root of x and we can verify that our similarity variable is of the form y over square root of x this is how y and x the independent variables should be combined in our similarity variable but this is not the only these are not this is not the combination that will make the similarity variable yet because this ratio is dimensional and we would like our similarity variable to be dimensionless so in order to make further progress we are going to use our simple black back of the envelope uh, analysis to correct the dimensions of of our similarity variable but this is already very promising that the similarity solution might be found so now onwards to the similarity solution we now do the back of the envelope analysis where you start with u the the governing equations del u del y equals nu del 2u del y square and del u del x plus del v del y equals 0 and here so excuse me Blasius solution and in here we substitute uh, u as u or actually we can do capital U V as capital V we don't know what it should be X as X and Y as Delta or you can keep it Y it doesn't matter these are all these are just symbols and we just want uh, a, a relation between these symbols so we already we already did this remember we almost did this kind of a thing um, in uh, in the motivation in the hand wavy calculation and we are going to now reproduce that hand it will turn out that this step will reproduce the hand wavy calculation because we will see what the left hand side will give me is u squared over x and the second term actually you know what before i write this let me make some space here and i'll write it in a different color So this term scales as u squared over x, v u over y, and nu u over delta squared. This is not a y, this is a delta. You can use a y, it's just a dummy symbol. And in the second equation, you have u over x and v over delta. And equating these two gives us v is u delta over x. Substitute that in here. And I recognize that will make these two terms equal. And then equating the u squared over x to the new u over delta squared gives me, excuse me again, uh, u squared over x is new u over delta squared will give me delta equals square root of new x over u. And our similarity variable now 
based on this delta is c is y over delta this is our similarity variable now let me just check in the notes if there is a constant that is conventionally used with this and uh, naturally you won't be expected to know this constant so if you don't use a constant there that's okay uh, but historically the uh, boundary layer thickness is defined with a factor of two and I'll keep the blue color in there to indicate that, well, this is something that you could not have predicted. But because this is done historically, I will keep it, keep this factor of two. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is our similarity variable in terms of the two. Let me write a note. The factor of two is for historical or just convention yeah. um, now having constructed the similarity variable now we can write down our uh, ansatz for the self-similar profile self-similar ansatz and the self-similar ansatz is u is capital U times a function. Now we'll write a capital function because we used f for something else, and I'll put a prime because I know I've, I need to I will need to integrate this function. If you don't see that right away, go through a few steps, and you will note that you will need to integrate this function. Function of c, our similarity variable, and v is uh, what should v be? v is 1 over square root of x so somehow that should come out right so we i don't know what to substitute here yet and I, I will leave it as it is so i have a expression for u an ansatz for u where c is y over delta and delta is square root of 2 new x over u and now i'm going to try and deduce v and really also f uh, so first let's just simplify the differential equation we'll worry about the boundary conditions a little later so let's start with mass conservation where you have del u del x plus del v del y equals zero and in here i want to substitute o but hang on, before we do this, we must find d delta dx. And if you do the same thing that I have been doing with similarity solutions all the time, delta over 2x, that's what you'll find. And from that, you'll find del c del x is minus c over 2x. Okay, so don't go ahead without deriving these two. And uh, we also have del c del y is 1 over delta. So now we have mass, let's start with mass conservation. You have del u del x plus del v del y equals 0. So I have the y derivative is the same as the c derivative times del c del y which is a 1 over delta is minus del u del x but u has this ansatz so I'm going to now substitute in there minus u f prime of c so it will become f double prime of c times d c dx which I've calculated there so that make, makes it minus plus u c over 2 x f double prime of c and delta 
is square root of 2 nu x over u so I plug that in here and I get del v del c is square root of 2 nu x over u times u divided by 2x times c f double prime of c so this is a function of c and this is not a function of c so so far as the c derivative on the left hand side is concerned we will only integrate the function of c the x can be treated as a constant right? so that's what that's what this simplification gave us we get square root of nu u over 2x on the uh, as a prefactor c f double prime of c and now i can integrate once to get v is square root of nu u over 2x c f prime of c minus f of c and here you will note that although i have the second derivative there because it is multiplied by c when i need to integrate this once I really need both the derivatives on f to be there because I get f. So that's really the reason why I started this answer with a prime. Okay. If you don't start with a prime, you come here and you notice that, oh, you need one more derivative. You need to integrate this expression once more and you can then go back and put the prime. So that is our answers for V. Now finally we have our answers for U and for uh, for V and we, are, we have one equation left X momentum equation U du dx plus V du dy equals nu d2u dy square if you now substitute u f prime of c from this u and the du dx which gives you a minus c over 2x times u f double prime of c we calculated this plus v which is square root of nu u over 2x times c f prime minus f and uh, dv du dy du dy that gives me a u f double prime of c divided by delta which is nu x over u And the right hand side is nu over delta square so 2 2 nu x over u times third derivative of f. Now this looks like a long complicated equation but by construction you will see that the following happens and by a little bit of coincidence something else also happens right so by construction the square root of uh, this and that gives you the new cancels there's a factor of u u squared so you get a u squared over x on both the terms on the left hand side minus c i'll put a factor of 2 out here also c f prime f double prime and that's from the first term and from the second term we have c f prime minus f f double prime and on the right hand side you have new the new cancels 
oh there should be an extra factor of u there u squared over 2x times f triple prime See? because we substituted the delta you notice that this thing these two factors cancel so let me just label them one and even inside this square bracket this term cancels with that one and we are left with the following equation f 1 2 3 plus f f 1 2 equals 0 this is the o d e for f so all we have to do now is couple it with the boundary conditions this is a third order differential equation so we need three boundary conditions and i just remembered that i forgot one of the boundary conditions so let me go back and add it thankfully this boundary condition does not violate our scale invariance we also need no penetration and you'll see that this is also trivially satisfied and doesn't violate no penetration. So now, if I take these four conditions and write them out in terms of our answers, we have the boundary conditions uh, u f prime of infinity is u from x equals 0 or y approaching infinity so this gives me f prime of infinity is 1 then we have f prime of 0 u f prime of 0 is 0 this is the no slip condition uh, at y equals 0 this gives me f prime of 0 is 0 and we have the no penetration condition which is a little tricky because i have to i need u sorry i need v so i substitute c equals zero in here and i get f of zero so i have f of zero equals zero times square root of whatever the thing is new u over 2x And this applies for x greater than 0. As y equals 0, x greater than 0. So this prefactor doesn't matter. And the condition we get is f of 0 is 0. So these are the three boundary conditions. That we need to solve our ODE with. Now let me make a comment about if you face such a question in an exam, uh, what do you expect to do after this? If this were a longer three hour exam and if the solution of this equation was analytically possible, I would have guided you through that solution. Maybe given you how to integrate or you know given you the solution and asked you to verify or some such thing and you can look at last year's exam and you can see that that's what that was the type of the question that appeared in the exam and uh, for the solution of the ODEs the solution was essentially given but this year it's going to be a shorter exam so I don't want you to waste time or spend too much time solving a complicated equation which you don't know the solution to exist or not or even if I give you the solution there isn't much fluid dynamical value to integrating this ODE necessarily. And therefore, I'm not going to ask you to integrate. But having said that, it's worthwhile to check what happens if you do integrate this uh, equation. Right? These are, uh, there are three conditions. So the specific technique used to integrate it is not really that important. But let's look at the solution here. Oh, oh. And there it is. The black dashed line is the solution of our differential equation. And you'll remember 
from uh, the lecture we scaled the velocity profiles the co numeric the computationally obtained velocity profiles on top of each other by plotting y divided by delta of x against little u divided by capital u and the solution of this differential equation falls right on top of the profiles which were already collapsed uh, onto something very tight. So this proves the that uh, this proves various things. One is that this sort of un understanding of a boundary layer is meaningful, and the way we obtain the boundary layer thickness is useful. It allows us some uh, physical intuition. Uh, and this, this also goes on to verify our approximation, the approximations that we made. Remember I told you, the way we do, the way we make, the way we construct approximate solutions is just that we just, we make assumptions about what might be negligible or what, what might not be. If your assumptions are correct, then you can go on to find a self-consistent solution, a solution that ends up obeying those assumptions that you started with. And indeed, that's what we find in this case. Not only does is the solution self-consistent, we should find the condition for that self-consistency. Uh, but once it is self-consistent, it, it also becomes a valid approximation to the underlying flow of the, or the solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. All right. So with this, let us now go back and examine each of our assumptions. Our main assumption was that delta over L be much less than 1. And because delta is nu x over u and L is L, so we have Hang on. Now let me just write this down. So new x. All right. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. New x over u is much less than l squared. And if I take everything, if I just rearrange the terms, I will get x over l is. is much less than u l over nu. Hang on, I'll need to think about this a bit. Yeah, there it goes. You will recognize this combination of parameters. u l over nu is u l mu over rho is rho u l over mu. This is nothing but the Reynolds number for the flow based on the length of the plate. And what this inequality says is so long as your uh, Reynolds number is large, then automatically x over L for some x will be comparable, some locations on the plate x will be comparable to the length of the plate. So the left hand side is approximately, can be approximately one. So our solution is valid whenever the Reynolds number is much larger than one. Right. And uh, indeed, uh, for our numerical computations, the, the Reynolds number was like 600 and something. Or so you can check in the notes. Uh, and that's the condition under which uh, this sort of solution uh, would apply. And we found that indeed it, it is uh, applicable. So this brings us to the last part, which is, I'm going to combine it with this video, which is the drag on a flat plate. This is our opportunity to correct 
D'Alembert's paradox, which is uh, in potential flow, there is no drag on any immersed body. And now we have explicitly accounted for viscosity and derived a flow which is not a potential flow. So, uh, what does it say about the drag on uh, the flat plate? So here, what we need to do is integrate T dot N dA on the boundary of our fluid. In this case, this boundary is just the length of the flat plate and times the width of the flat plate, which we will take to be unity. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we need to integrate is the stress tensor dotted with n hat. The components of the stress tensor are, excuse me again, the components of the stress tensor are minus p plus 2 mu del u del x mu del u del y plus del v del x. I'm just writing the Newtonian stress tensor mu del u del y plus del v del x minus p plus 2 mu del v del y and the unit normal is 0 1 right. and that's the integration we want to carry out and in this case let's just take the width to be unit so we'll find expressions per unit width 0 to l dx now I will get along the x direction I will get mu del u del y plus del v del x and on the y direction minus p plus 2 mu del v del y all right so this would be the force on the flat plate the x component of the force which I will write as f1 will simply be integral 0 to l dx times mu del u del y plus del v del x but remember out of these two terms they don't necessarily need to be of the same strength del u del y will scale like u over delta and del v del x will, will scale like v over x and v is nothing but u delta over x 1 over x so if you take the ratio of the two you'll notice that u over delta is much much bigger than u delta over x squared and therefore the second term del v del x can be neglected in boundary layer theory because delta over x is much less than one because the boundary layer is thin and for the remaining del u del y term now we have a simple answer for the velocity profile dx mu uh, u f double prime of c divided by delta that's how the y derivative will fall out and now this uh, is to be evaluated at c equals 0 on the walls f which comes out of the integral mu u also comes out of the integral delta of x is dx square root of 2 nu x over u and this is a simple integral to perform when all is said and done we get f double prime of 0 times square root of 2 mu rho u cubed L. It turns out that f double prime of 0 is 0 0.664 from solving that equation numerically. So the drag on one face of the flat plate is approximately equal to 0 0.664 square root of, oh sorry, not 0 0.664. It's 0 
because this, there is a square root of 2 inside so I have taken that out mu rho u cubed l okay. and this is approximately the drag on a flat plate I have compared this drag with what I computed numerically or computationally using COMSOL in a table in the notes and you'll find that this expression in fact works really really well this is used in engineering design this ex final expression is used in engineering design whenever you have a simple situation where you have flow past a, a flat surface and it works uh, really well and you can see the advantage of using a little bit of theoretical analysis uh, in place of numerical computation numerical computation will give you the answer for one set of parameters at a time but the theoretical analysis will give you the dependence on all the parameters at once it's very easy to understand why if there is no flow if u is zero the drag is zero or if the fluid has no viscosity or has vanishingly small viscosity the drag also vanishes with it uh, similarly if the plate has no length it cannot experience any drag but I'm going to leave the last parameter the density why does the density appear in the drag and if the density of the fluid vanishes why does the drag vanish even if the fluid has the fluid could have perhaps some finite dynamic viscosity so I will leave that as a puzzle to the viewer to the keen student interested in pursuing fluid dynamics so this is the last video I'm going to upload uh, for this module it has been an incredible pleasure making these videos for you I, I truly feel like I'm making the, these videos with you so with that uh, I still have the chance to see you tomorrow and day after in the live sessions. So this time I'm going to say I hope to see you all in the live sessions. Bye-bye.